Let's open up our Bibles to the Song of Solomon, chapter 5. As we discussed when we began this book of the Bible, the Song of Solomon gives us really snapshots of a relationship between a couple that begins as an engaged couple, and then they come into marriage, and then it describes something of their married life between them. And tonight, we're going to see something uh, that not only describes some of the intimacy of their married life, but, but also some of the difficulty that they have to work through. And it's really a very interesting and engaging chapter. Uh, again, it's snapshots of what it means to live uh, this life of, of a married couple before God. They're not necessarily set in chronological order, but in Song of Solomon chapter 4, they were brought together here in marriage, and now this seems like it could be the kind of dynamic that might happen between a husband and a wife. We're going to pick it up at verse 2 of Song of Solomon chapter 5, because really verse 1 is attached to chapter 4, and we discussed it in our study last time. So Song of Solomon chapter five, beginning now at verse two, it's the maiden speaking. And and again, just uh, if I may say this, and I hope I don't extend things too long with these little side comments. You'll notice in your Bible, it's sort of blocked out, the maiden, the beloved, the Shulamite, that, and you say, well, how do they know who's speaking? They know it by the um, feminine or masculine nature of the Hebrew pronouns and nouns. That, that's how they know who's speaking where. And sometimes it's a little bit uncertain, but we really don't have those troubles here in this particular chapter. Okay, uh, Song of Solomon, chapter five, verse two. I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. Very powerful in its poetic beauty. I mean, did you just see that first line of verse two? I sleep, but my heart is awake. You see, in this poetic snapshot, the maiden describes another dream-like experience. And whether this actually happened, or it's a dream, or it's just poetry, it doesn't really matter. We get the picture. The maiden is described as either being asleep, yet she's dreaming or in that twilight of almost sleep where you're not quite sure whether you're asleep or awake. And what does she hear when she's sort of in that state? She hears the voice of my beloved. Did you see that line in verse two? In her half awake, half asleep state, the maiden heard the voice of her beloved outside her door. He had come maybe for an unexpected rendezvous, maybe for a law after a long day of looking after his responsibilities. You can picture it in his mind. Uh, Work kept him at the office, kept him at the job far too late, and now he comes home and, and, and he's come back and he He calls out to his beloved and she hears his voice. Then, after calling out, look at the next line, he knocks saying, open for me, my sister, my love. Now, having come in some way unexpectedly, maybe it was just later, Maybe she waited up for him and he was so long detained at his business that she finally went to bed and oh, whenever he'll come home. But now she's startled, she wakes up. He calls out, open for me, my sister, my love. Presumably it's his own home as well, but but she needs to open up the door. Now, by the way, it isn't really important whether or not this section should be chronologically arranged before or after the wedding. Is this an engaged couple? Is this a married couple? It doesn't really matter. This is just sort of a dream sequence. She might be dreaming. She might be an engaged woman dreaming of married life to come. Or she may be a married woman dreaming of that. It doesn't really matter in this particular situation. But look at how he calls out from outside the door. My sister, my dove, my love, my perfect one. He first called to his maiden, but the sound of his voice wasn't enough. Then he knocked, but that wasn't enough. Then what did he do? He affectionately praised his maiden with each one of these warm and complimentary terms. But this was not enough to rouse her from bed and to persuade her to get up and open the door. He calls, my sister, my love, 
my dove, my perfect one. But by the way, you, you could say, well, is this some kind of hillbilly arrangement when he calls out to her, is it her sister? No, no. No, what, what you have here is it's a very affectionate term. And I'll tell you one of the things that it suggests very powerfully is permanence. Your brother or your sister is your brother or your sister for life. I affectionately love you as a sister. My love, my dove, and, and then that, that great phrase, my perfect one. And so he appeals to her on that basis. Sweetie, I love you so much. You're so precious to me. Won't you open the door? She still doesn't answer. So what does he do? One more time, he makes the appeal now a little bit sympathetic. He says, for my head is covered with dew. It's raining out here. I'm getting wet. Would you please open the door? You know, like a shepherd who's out late at night watching over the flocks, his head is wet with the moisture of the dew that covers the land that night. So do you see how thoroughly he makes his appeal? Won't you let me come into the home? First he calls out to her, then he knocks, then he praises her, then he gives a personal appeal. It's a desperate appeal. It's a desperate, skillfully made appeal, yet for all of this, the maiden will not open up the door. It's really an interesting and a very uh, uh, engaging picture here that we have in verse two. Now, before we go on to verse three, this picture of the beloved standing outside the door and appealing to his bride for entry This may provide the only New Testament reference to the Song of Solomon. And I'm not saying positively it's a connection, but you gotta admit, it's certainly engaging to read Revelation 3.20 that says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. This idea of Jesus, like in that iconic picture of Jesus standing at the door, this is something of the posture of the beloved calling out to his maiden. Here I am. Won't you let me in? And again, before I go on to verse three, shouldn't I just really understand here that if we want to draw the spiritual analogy of the Song of Solomon, which it isn't its primary meaning. Primarily, it's a, it's a book exalting the glory of romantic love between a, a husband and a wife. But if we want to understand the spiritual analogy there, think of how sometimes Jesus appeals to us. He calls out to us. He knocks to us. He tells us how much he loves us and how precious we are to him. And, and, and then he appeals to our sympathies as well. And for all of that, sometimes we will not still open the door to Jesus and say, come and connect with me, Jesus. So you have this scene. The maiden's on the inside. The beloved is on the outside. She will not open the door. Look at what she responds here in verse three. I've taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I defile them? My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door and my heart yearned for him. I arose to open for my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leapt up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. So what's her first response to the outside looking in? It's as if the the husband on the outside, the the, the wife is on the inside. He's knocking, he's calling, he's praising her. She still won't open. And what does she say? Well, essentially she says, I've taken off my, my robe. How can I put it on again? In response to the beloved's warm appeal, let's face it, the maiden only answered with excuses. Hey, I'm comfortable in bed. I've washed my feet. I don't want the inconvenience of dressing myself or getting up and getting my feet dirty on the floor again. No, no, no. How can I defile them? Now, perhaps in this picture, She's simply not willing to be inconvenienced. Perhaps she didn't appreciate the unexpected nature of the beloved's visit. Perhaps he came much later than expected. I mean, is it crazy to think, well, you kept me up all night and you didn't come home when I was expecting. Well, you, you, just stay out there. You, you, you troubled me, now I'm gonna trouble you. But perhaps this was her effort to 
control the relationship. Hey, after all, why should I run as soon as he knocks? He can wait a little while. I I don't know what, but whatever the specific reason, she refused to promptly rise from her bed and open the door. Now, notice this. The problem wasn't that she didn't go to the door. Eventually she does in these very verses. But when she finally gets to the door, she did it so slowly, so reluctantly, so much making excuses along the way that the moment was gone. And by the time she finally got to the door, he's gone. I like what uh, one commentator, Dennis Kinlaw, says about this. He says, quote, This is a remarkable picture of the kind of adjustments that are necessary in lifestyle in marriage. Our natural sloth or laziness, the differences between a man and a woman, our uncertainty about the other's thinking, the variations in our life rhythms, our unwillingness to alter our preferred patterns for the other, our own self-consciousness, all contribute to the problem of reading each other's advances. And you know, I love this. I love this this problem here in the Song of Solomon. Because look, let's face it. From the first four chapters of the Song of Solomon, it's just been an unrestricted ride to romantic glory. It's like, oh, the best relationship ever. Oh, I'm swept away on the wings of love. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a couple that had real life problems. This is a couple where the husband and wife, sometimes they're not connecting, they're meshing. They're not meshing, I mean. It's conflict, and it's causing worse and worse problems. And then the beloved starts, you know, working the handle of the door. She can hear it, you know, there. It's it's as if he's shaking the doorknob there. It says there in verse 4, My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door. The maiden could hear that the beloved put his hand on the latch mechanism of the door. It's a clear and final indication of his desire to enter in and be with her, but only at her invitation. We almost get the picture like this. The beloved says, my hand is on the door and I can come in anytime I want, but I'm not going to come in until you open the door. Out of respect to you, I will not force myself upon you in any way, but if you will open the door, we can come together as husband and wife. Now, I gotta talk a little bit about verse four right here because some commentators and translators have wondered if the wording here is not actually a double entendre, cleverly describing sexual intercourse between the beloved and the maiden. And I said, well, what are they talking about? His, his, my beloved put his hand by the latch of the door. What is this even talking about? Well, ladies and gentlemen, the basis of this is found in the fact that at least on one occasion in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word that's translated hand here in verse 4, in Isaiah chapter 57 verse 8, it's pretty clearly a euphemism for the male sexual organ. And some people wonder if it's being used uh, used as a euphemism for male genitalia right here. In addition, the word translated latch of the door is more literally opening or whole. And again, without getting too crass, but this is at least potentially a pretty explicit passage here in the Song of Solomon. Look at how some other Bible translations deal with this phrase. Uh, The NIV says, my lover thrust his hand through the latch opening. The New American Standard, my beloved extended his hand through the opening. Uh, The Septuagint, my kinsman put forth his hand by the hole of the door. The King James Version, my beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door. The, The New Living Translation, my lover tried to unlatch the door. So do you see where some translators and commentators think that there's actually a clever double entendre here that's actually describing sexual intercourse with with the male genitalia and the female genitalia. Now, I'll let you know how I see this. I'll allow for the slight possibility of that based on how Isaiah 57 verse eight 
translates or takes that word hand in that passage. I don't think that's the clear meaning of the section though. And this is why. The idea of a couple engaged in intercourse, it doesn't match the context. The context here is about a missed connection, not a made connection. The the whole context here is he's on the outside looking in. And, And while it might be maybe a little clever play on words, I don't think it's used to describe sexual intercourse here between the maiden and her beloved. Because again, the whole context argues that he's on the outside and is not allowed to enter and visit his maiden. She obviously loved and longed for her beloved, yet she refused to promptly open the door for him. Now, when she finally does get around to it, look at verse 5. I arose to open for my beloved. Notice, it wasn't that she refused to respond to her husband. It's that she was so long delayed in doing so and she delayed out of self-interest and perhaps self-indulgence, probably connected with some level of resentment towards her beloved. And by the way, doesn't the writer give us really an emotionally accurate picture of the dynamic of a conflict in a relationship, especially in marriage? I I mean, just kind of check this out. The maiden feels resentment towards the beloved. Uh, Whether that resentment is justified or not, we can't really tell according to the context. But the maiden feels resentment towards the beloved. The beloved refuses to force himself upon his maiden and is only going to enter in at her invitation. The, The beloved makes a true and persistent appeal to his maiden that they might be together and enjoy their relationship. But because of that resentment, the maiden long delays her response to the desire of the beloved, and then when she finally does respond, it seems too late. The moment's gone, and the beloved is gone. Now, I I don't know about you, but that's a picture that is real in married relationships. And in applying the dynamic of this kind of conflict to a relationship, you can fairly reverse the roles of maiden and beloved and wife and husband, but the fundamental principles remain. You can do a lot of damage in a relationship by doing the following things, by holding on to resentment and refusing to be generous with forgiveness. You could say that this all began with somehow the maiden holding on to some resentment. Number two, you can do a lot of damage in a relationship by attempting to force one's interest and affections upon another and not waiting for them to respond and invite. You can cause damage in a relationship by refusing or delaying response when you're approached in a loving and persistent way. And you can do damage in a relationship when you fail to appreciate the value of an appeal to resume or build relationships. Again, typically out of some kind of self-interest or self-indulgence, or maybe it's a desire to control the relationship. When she finally gets to the door, what does it say? Verse five, and my hands dripped with myrrh. As she finally rose from the bed and came to the door, she noticed that the door of the latch, that the door handle, whatever it was, had been anointed with sweet perfume. This was another reminder of the beauty and the quality of the love that the beloved had for the maiden. That they say in the ancient world, and look, I, I don't know if you could verify this except by getting in a time machine and going back there, but they say in the ancient world, that like leaving a bouquet of flowers on a doorstep, they would anoint a door or its latch with a sweet smelling lotion or perfume as sort of a calling card saying, your beloved was here, your beloved was here. Because when you go down and touch the door latch, you go, wow, I I smell his presence. I smell his, his love note, so to speak. That's the idea. Now I want you to notice How did the beloved respond when his maiden was pushing him away or being so long in her response that it felt like she was pushing him away? How did he respond? He said, I'm going to leave her a love note. I'm going to smear some of this ointment on the latch so that when she finally does come, she'll know I was here and I love you. Listen, that's beautiful. 
because it will soon awaken a loving response in her. And it's a wonderful way, or excuse me, it's a wonderful picture of the way that a husband should respond when he feels pushed away or disrespected by his wife. Listen, husband, you feel pushed away or disrespected by your wife, do not respond in anger. No, display your love for her in a non-threatening way and wait for her response of love. That's exactly what the beloved did in this situation. But what was the result? Look at it here in verse six. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. When she finally came to the door, she shook off her self-indulgence. Okay, I'll put my robe on. Okay, I'll get my feet dirty. She comes to the door. She, she sees or smells his love note, the lotion that he smeared on the latch. And she says, he's gone. It's too late. And then notice this, verse six, this is even more heart tugging. I called him, but he gave no answer. Now the roles are reversed. How did the chapter begin? The chapter began with him calling to her and she didn't respond. Now he calls out to him, but he's gone. She had foolishly waited too long to respond and it actually worked against her own self-interest. Now, again, it doesn't really matter whether this describes an actual scene poetically or just the dream. Um, notice this. In the dream scenario, the slowness of her response is directly connected with the difficulty in finding him. Again, I'll move on to verse 7 in a moment. But, but, but shouldn't I say this? Let's understand, primarily, this is a book glorying in the wonder of romantic love. However, it does teach us something about our own relationship with Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus knocks, we need to respond. We need to answer him. When our beloved calls out to us, I mean, look at how beautifully he did it. He called, he knocked, he pers- tried to persuade with love, he even put his hand in, and then he left a love note, even when she came late. But, but, but there's a sense in which a moment of true fellowship and growth can pass us by in the Christian life if we do not respond when Jesus calls. Now on to verse 7. The watchmen who went about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took my veil away from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, tell, you tell him that I am lovesick. So what does the maiden do? She comes to the door. She smells her hand. It's his love note. He was here. She opens the door. Where are you? He's gone. She calls out for her beloved. He's nowhere to be found. She says, I'm going to find him. She goes out and about the city, and as she's wandering about, she receives some rough treatment from the watchmen of the city. In her dream, the maiden sought and called for the beloved, but now she extends the dream out, and she doesn't find any help from the watchmen or the keepers of the walls. Again, um, they push her around a little bit. They, 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 They take her veil from her. By the way, veil there is probably better understood as a scarf or a mantle. It's not the same word for veil that's used otherwise. And then we picture her in her dream. She's calling out to to the daughters of Jerusalem, to the people who are on looking in this little poetic picture here. She calls out to them, hey, if you see my beloved, tell him that I am lovesick. This is her plea to the daughters of Jerusalem. She came to regret and to suffer from her previous actions. Now notice this. (laughs) Now she says she's lovesick, but not in the same way that the phrase was used in chapter two, verse five. In Song of Psalms chapter two, verse five, she's overwhelmed by the presence of love. And she's like, I'm sick with love in the most wonderful way. Now she's lovesick in a sense of dread. Maybe I've lost him. Maybe I've pushed him away too much. 
Maybe I've made them wait too long. Maybe I haven't responded well enough. Again, Dennis Kinlaw, excellent commentary on the Song of Solomon. He says, quote, there is a realism in the Song of Solomon that merits our respect. The course of true love seldom runs smoothly for long. For every moment of ecstasy, there seems to be the moment of hurt and pain. Listen, well, that's real life. I mean, I wish I could stand before you and say, listen, if you love Jesus, uh, everything's gonna be just ecstasy and wonder in your married life. No, you'll have your share of hurt and pain in the relationship, but don't let that dissuade you. God will use even that and, and reward you with great blessing in the midst of it. Now going on to verse nine. These are the daughters of Jerusalem speaking about the beloved. You know, she called out to them, tell them I'm lovesick. Now they answer her, well, what is your beloved more than another beloved, O fairest among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved that you so charge us? Again, this sort of dream sequence is pretty awesome. Now you picture a chorus of women singing this on the side, and what are they singing? They go, hey, what's so special about your guy? You told us, Oh, tell him that you're sick with love about him. And it's almost as if they're saying to him, hey, sweetie, there's a lot of fish in the sea. It didn't work between you and this guy. Just go find somebody else. What's so special about your guy? And she wouldn't be the first woman to receive that kind of advice from the daughters of Jerusalem or a chorus of friends around her. But what's her response? Look at it here in verse 10, and this is beautiful. She's gonna describe her beloved. Now, Pause right here before we read the description. In Song of Solomon chapter four, the beloved described the maiden. Remember that hair like a flock of goats, teeth like shorn sheep, you know, all this, neck like a tower. And you kind of go, well, that's all weird. Well, notice this. He described her in terms of great love and appreciation. Now she's going to describe him the same way. Again, prompted by the question, hey, what's so great about this guy? Why don't you just find another? So she says, I'll tell you what's great about my guy. Verse 10, my beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are like a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is carved ivory, inlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble, set on bases of fine gold. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Isn't that an awesome little speech there from the maiden? You want to know what's so special about my guy? I'll tell you what's so special about my beloved. And she goes through this amazing description, starting with those words, my beloved is. Now, um, the description uses a lot of figures of speech, just like the beloved's description of the maiden did, starting at the head, going down to the maiden, and then giving just sort of a general one about his countenance and all. But I want you to notice something. What was the condition of the maiden when she was in bed and the beloved was calling out and knocking? Who did she think of? I don't want to put on my robe. I don't want to dirty my feet. She's thinking of herself. When she starts thinking of not about herself, but about her beloved, she remembers what is so wonderful about him to her. It, it's almost like she's talking herself into a refreshment of her love. After all, if she thought this way about him at the beginning of the chapter, she would have jumped up from bed and opened the door at the first call. But look, these things happen in relationships, do they not? She, she had to come to this place, but she had to come to it over some rough territory. But now she's there and she's thinking about her beloved and what a wonderful man he is. 
notice this. She did not say these things to her beloved, but she said these things about him in the presence of others. It was more important for her to be convinced of how wonderful he was than for him to be convinced at how wonderful he was. Now, I don't know. Look, it's sometimes in the nature of a man, you already think you're pretty wonderful. You know, you, you, you may not need to hear it from your wife. I, I don't know, men are different, but you already think, yeah, okay, whatever. But you know what? Your wife may need to remind herself about the qualities in you that makes her find herself wonderful. She doesn't say these things to him. She says them to herself and to others. And she begins her description, verse 10, my beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000s. So she describes his countenance, white and ruddy. Basically, the idea is um, pale, which was thought to be attractive in that culture, pale, but with rosy cheeks, white and ruddy. And not only was he of bright countenance and attractive by the standards of that time, but he was a great man. You know, perhaps the most telling line in the whole description is found right there in verse 10. Chief among 10,000. She loved him not only for his physical appearance and not only for who he was to her, but she loved him for his character. Ladies and gentlemen, this can't be replaced in a marriage relationship. Now, on the one hand, you feel like the preacher should start talking to the wives. Wives, look for that thing in your man's character that you can respect. I know you may feel that you've lost some respect for your husband, but, but there were qualities in him that drew you to him. Look for those qualities. Remember them. They're still there. Even if they've diminished, they're still there. Remind yourself of your love and appreciation and respect for that man. I could talk to the wives about that, and that's a valid point to do. It's a valid point to draw from this text. But is it not equally valid to speak to the husbands? Say, husbands, are you really living up to the appreciation and the respect that you wish your wife would give to you? Do you deserve it? I mean, honestly. Sometimes the man who longs the most for respect is sort of objectively speaking, deserving of it the least. There's something here for the wives to hear for sure, because no doubt there are husbands who deserve the respect who aren't getting it, but there's some husbands who, res uh, who expect the respect, but they don't deserve it. W why don't you determine, I'm gonna be a man of such character, of such goodness, of such honor before God and man that my wife can look at me and say, no matter what your skin tone is, my beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. This guy is one in 10,000. There's something special about him. And let me tell you something. You don't have to be a fashion model to do that. You don't have to be rich to do that. You need to be a man of godliness and character. And as we see this stinking world crumbling around us, men of godliness and character stand out even more. Maybe we need to change the equation. It's not one in 10,000 anymore. Now it's one in 100,000. But that, that's just what we see and what we can be as men of godliness and character. Did you ever hear that expression? Endeavor to be the kind of man that your dog thinks you are. You know, your dog looks at you with those eyes. Oh, my master, look at him and this and that. What, live up to that. Well, why don't you try to be the kind of man that, that can genuinely merit the respect of your wife. So she describes the beloved as radiant and attractive, beginning from the head and working her way down. His head is like the finest gold. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of waters. Yes, verse 16, he is altogether lovely. That summarizes her description. 
In her mind, there's something complete and great in this man's physical appearance, but as his standing as a man. I mean, you could say that he was tall and handsome. He had a tan face and a dark hair, but his eyes were soft and tender. His cologne smelled good, and his hands were so strong yet gentle that they were as precious as gold. Most of all, he was a man of character. Now, I, um, I, I do need to understand another thing here, though. Again, to draw the spiritual analogy, which we're not majoring on, but I don't want to ignore it. Could you describe Jesus in all his glorious qualities the same way that the maiden could describe her beloved? You know, sometimes the most interesting and revealing question to ask a believer, who is Jesus to you? Uh, uh, uh. Now, I, I don't mean to mock somebody who just, the words don't come easily, the thoughts are there, but, but really, I mean, some of us are like that. You think, yeah, great for you, Pastor David, you're a big blabbermouth, not everybody can do that. But no, 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 I'm talking about that nothing really comes even to your head or your heart. But, but if Jesus is precious to us, shouldn't it be on the tip of our tongue? Oh, he's the one who forgave my sins. He's the one who gave me new life. He's the one who filled me with his spirit. He is the way, the truth, and the life for me. He's like a vine that I have to abide in. He, he's like a glorious lion in my life that frightens away the enemies of my soul. He, he's the alpha and he's the omega. He's my beginning and my end. He, he's the forerunner of my faith. He's the captain of my salvation. And these things aren't just Bible words that are in your head, but they're in your heart. You could describe your beloved Beloved, in the beautiful terms, the way that the maiden describes her beloved. That's why when it comes to verse 16, there's this beautiful power in this. Look at verse 16. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Hey, you, you chorus of my girlfriends. You, you told me, forget about this guy. I can't find him. There's lots of fish in the sea. No way. This is my man. This is my beloved. And don't you love that line? This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Yeah, I just think it's so wonderful. I think it's wonderful that she uses the word my. My beloved. My friend. Other people may love him, but he's my beloved. He may be friends with other people, but he's my friend in a powerful and wonderful way. Now, when I was younger and younger in my married life, when I would hear people describe older married couples, and they'd say of their husband or their wife, she's my best friend. I'd be kind of like, yeah, whatever. You know, you're not playing basketball with her, are you? I mean, you know, she can't defend you. I mean, your best friend, what, you know? She's not going out on pre-dawn hikes to go fishing lakes and mammoth with you. I mean, what, your best friend, what does that even mean? And that's how I thought when I was younger. Now, I think I know what it means. And there is something so wonderful, so gratifying in being able to say, my beloved, my friend. Well, that's what God wants for us in our relationships. But prayerfully not your only friend, although you know what? Sometimes it'll feel like that. But isn't that why God gave us that special person? to be our beloved, to be our friend. And at the end of it all, should that not be what we say about Jesus in our life? He is the one who loves me and he is my friend. All right, let me wrap this up. 
this conclusion of the maiden, it leads us to the very logical question. After she finishes this impassioned thing, I don't know, if you're making a movie of it, tears are streaming down she, as she says to her, her girlfriend, my beloved and my friend. The logical question is, then why'd you keep him waiting so long at the door? Well, that's how it is in relationships, isn't it? So sometimes we do think, why did I do that? Why? That's why we need so much love and so much forgiveness and so much forbearance one with another. You see, when she was brought back to a fresh appreciation of the one she loved, the maiden was all the more sorrowful for how she responded just selfishly before. Now, wives, you may read this description of the beloved and go, yeah, wish I had a guy like that. A wife may think that this describes the kind of man that she could love. Goes, but where's that guy? Well, let me remind you, you should probably remember that at least at one time, your husband was that kind of man and you can see him that way again. Instead of telling yourself, I deserve better than him, why don't you just find a way to be amazed at the man you once had and still do? Now, the exact same reasoning applies husbands to wives. Do you find yourself dissatisfied with your wife? Remind yourself of the things that drew you to her initially and look for those things, even if they are but a spark still within her, and ask God to give you the grace to develop them once again into a beautiful flame. Song of Solomon shows us the beauty and the power of married love, but man, it also shows us some of the problems. I'm so grateful that it gives us God's way in and through them. Father in heaven, this is our prayer. Uh, Lord, uh, first of all, I, I pray for those um, who read this and uh, it feels so empty to them, Lord, because they wish they had a maiden or a beloved in their life and they long for that. Well, Jesus, I, I just pray that you would speak to and um, honor those in our midst to whom you have given the gift of singleness, uh, Lord, whether it's, it's forever or temporary. But Lord, for those who are married, um, I pray that you would make their marriage a true blessing. And Lord, not a, a burden to them. And Father, most of all, teach us to respond to the call of Jesus, the knock of Jesus, the invitation of Jesus. Make us very responsive to our beloved Jesus Christ. Do it, Lord, in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.